Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vasilis Vasilikos. I'm a professor of cardiology from Greece, Thessaloniki, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you uh, for this uh, very interesting uh, session. And uh, I would like to express my gratitude, uh, my thanks to Garrett and the organizers. Uh, I, as far as I've been uh, concerned, uh, Dr. Tsinier is going to be a little bit late, so I'm going to start, if you don't mind. So over the next uh, hour or so, we're going to discuss uh, the risk uh, stratification of atrial arrhythmias. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Burak uh, to talk about uh, the P wave indices and uh, the prediction of atrial fibrillation. Dr. Burak. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, can you see my my screen? Yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, hi, colleagues. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, attending this meeting. I'm going to discuss the P-wave indices and uh, prediction of uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, the, you see the P-wave parameters that, that uh, I'm going to discuss. The, these parameters reflect underlying uh, atrial structure, size, and uh, electrical activation and alterations in these factors manifest as abnormalities in P-wave parameters that uh, can be ascertained from ECG. Uh, alterations, uh, alterations, especially in duration and morphology, have been considered as uh, risk factors for different clinical events uh, and principally AF and, and ischemic stroke. As you, as you may recall, in, uh, interatrial block was described by uh, De Luna in, in early 1980s. Uh, interatrial block is a conduction delay between the right and left atria and frequently seen in the elderly patients with structurally, structural heart disease. The current ECG criteria of uh, interatrial block are defined uh, partial interatrial block manifests as P wave uh, longer than 120 milliseconds without a negative deflection uh, in inferior leads. Whereas, uh, if the block in the Bachmann bundle is complete, which is defined as uh, advanced interatrial block, the left atrium is activated retrogradely via muscular bundles located close to the AV junction. So, in advanced interatrial block, not only is the P wave duration longer, the, longer than 120 milliseconds, but also the P wave morphology in, in inferior leads is also biphasic. You see, this meta analysis is designed to examine whether interatrial block predicts new onset atrial fibrillation or AF recurrence, and published in International Journal of Cardiology in 2018. They included uh, 16 studies and more than uh, 18,000 patients with a mean follow up of uh, 15 years. And the main findings are interatrial block is a significant predictor of new onset atrial fibrillation with a hazard ratio of 2.4. Advanced interatrial block, uh, but not partial uh, interatrial block, was significantly associated with new onset at AF with a hazard ratio of 2. And interatrial block also predicted AF recurrence after ablation. Uh, the other prospective observational registry that included 156 patients older than uh, 70 years with uh, structural heart disease and no previous diagnosis of AF, they showed that the presence of advanced interatrial block is independently associated with atrial fibrillation and stroke. And also, PV duration was also associated with, uh, with all cause mortality. You see a couple of minor curves of survival free of AF and or stroke for each group. 
that show significantly higher incidence incidences of AF in patients with uh, advanced intraatrial block. The other PV parameter is uh, PV duration. Uh, in this study, the aim of uh, the aim uh, was to obtain a detailed description of the relationship between PV duration and the risk of AF. Almost 3,000 individuals were included during median follow-up period of 6.3 years, and almost 10,000 uh, developed atrial fibrillation. It has been found that both short and long PV duration are associated with incident AF. The association between increased PV duration and the risk of AF can be explained by progression of uh, atrial structural abnormalities like injury caused by fibrosis or calcification uh, that cause prolongation in atrial conduction time and, and the development of atrial fibrillation. But interestingly, it was observed that also a short PV duration is associated with an increased risk of AF. And their hypothesis is that a more rapid conduction time may provide a substrate for re-entry in the early stages of arrhythmia. The other PV parameter is PV terminal force in V1, and it's calculated by multiplying the duration of terminal force by amplitude. On the right side, you see the transverse section of heart showing propagation of signs of depolarization from right to left atrium. In the upper panel, you see the normal situation that atrial impulse conduct from the right to left via the Bachmann bundle anteriorly and myocardial connections uh, posteriorly, which is the normal conduction. But in the lower panel, there is an interatrial conduction over the Bachmann bundle, but no or minimal uh, contribution from the posterior connections. So, uh, as a result, an anterior posterior activation of the left atrium results in a negative component of the terminal portion of uh, P wave uh, in V1. Uh, for in, a, in another study, for each standard deviation increment in P wave terminal force in V1, the risk of AF increases by 23%. The upper 50 percentile of PV terminal force is associated with almost twofold increased risk of AF than lower 95 percentile. And uh, abnormal, abnormal PV terminal force was also found to be independently associated with five-fold increased risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. You see the, uh, another PV parameters, which is the PV axis. As you know, a normal PV axis is between zero and plus 75, and PV axis is measured on the frontal plane. It was reported that abnormal PV axis is associated with increased incidence of atrial fibrillation in community-based uh, cohort studies. Abnormal PV axis was independently associated uh, with 2.3-fold increases uh, increased risk of uh, atrial fibrillation. The other P wave parameters is P wave voltage. Uh, this is a study uh, by Park et al. published in Europe in 2016. A total of uh, 525 patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who underwent uh, RF ablation were included in the study. And they found that PV amplitude less than 0 .0 0.1 millivolt in lead one is independently associated with uh, clinical recurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation. On the right side, you see the Kaplan-Meier analysis showed high recurrence in patients with low amplitude compared with those with high uh, PV amplitude in, in, lead, in lead one. In here, you see two examples of P waves in, in lead one, uh, LA voltage map and LA activation map from patients who remain in sinus rhythm uh, for, for 15 months in panel A and uh, experienced a recurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation four months uh, after ablation in, in panel B. Patient in panel B has low amplitude and uh, 
uh, low LA voltage and also slower uh, left atrial conduction. Now I'm going to show another P wave uh, parameters uh, that's the P wave dispersion. Uh, the difference between the P wave maximum and minimum duration in the 12 leads uh, is CG. The P wave duration uh, also has been shown to be an independent predictor of uh, AF, AF occurrence in patients uh, with presenting with uh, cryptogenic stroke. Now the question is, it's a good editorial, should we anticoagulate patients at high risk of ablation? These are characteristics associated with higher thromboembolic risk in patients with uh, advanced interatrial block. P wave duration longer than 160 milliseconds, obvious structural heart disease, uh, atrial premature beats or runs, and Charles was score of 2 and, uh, and high. Increase the risk of thromboembolism. Patients with a high risk, uh, high chest vas score show, show an increased prevalence of atrial fibrillation. Thromboembolic complications appear to be independent of presence of AF when this score uh, is, is very high. Before this approach can be generally recommended, we need two prerequisites uh, must be met. The first one is the, the creation of a registry including patients with advanced uh, interatrial block and the characteristics listed in the table. And also a control group compromising patients with a, with a similar profile but uh, partial interatrial block. And the second uh, is that if this registry shows that patients with advanced interatrial block have higher risk of stroke, reg regardless of AF, a clinical trial should be performed with uh, anticoagulation, anticoagulants and a control group to determine if anticoagulation therapy can reduce the incidence of stroke and uh, co cognitive decline in these patients. It's all, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, move uh, onwards and uh, have the discussion at the end, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Chetin, uh, who is going to talk about uh, how do we manage patients with uh, atrial height, high recordings in 2022. Is Dr. Chetin with us? Okay, uh, probably Dr. Chetin is not uh, with us yet. Is Dr. Mertz with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, so we're going to move. Uh, okay, so uh, Dr. Matt is going to talk about uh, uh, will atrial myopathy answer all gray zones? You know that atrial myopathy is quite uh, common now in our talks and we talk about atrial myopathy all the time, but uh, how can we distinguish that or clinically or if it's going of course, uh, to give us uh, more insights in the prognosis of atrial fibrillation, please. Okay, I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. Uh, just uh, to save some time, uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, Dr. Burak, uh, what is your opinion uh, about uh, the... Uh, first of all, do you use uh, these uh, P-wave indices in your clinical practice, first of all? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, to be honest, in every patient we we check for uh, PVAs morphology because I'm working with Dr. Uh, Baranchuk in in Queen's University. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, without uh, showing the atrial fibrillation and with just the uh, PVA morphology, we don't start any anticoagulation uh, at the point of time. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are no data still, and uh, exactly, yeah. it's quite, it's very tempting, to be honest. But do you use any artificial intelligence in, you know, it's quite popular nowadays to mm -hmm. use, uh, you know, all these fancy algorithms using uh, the data derived from the P-wave? I, I would say not yet, but I, yeah. I will. Okay, we, we we have some work uh, published uh, using uh, wavelet analysis of uh, the P wave, and also then we used the uh, special classifier. The, we ended up with uh, uh, let's, we call it a bit to bit uh, uh, index, uh, and uh, we tested this against all the the usual. Uh, indices, the P-wave indices, the known the indices you described. And uh, the, the ROC curve was much better and the performance of this was better. But on the other hand, it's more difficult to calculate this because it required, uh, uh, you know, special mathematics. So, you know, the, you have to use a special software. To, but anyway, uh, my belief is that uh, there are lots of uh, hidden information in this uh, in the P wave still, and uh, the, we have to discover that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Mert, are you ready? Hello? Uh, can you see my screen? I yes, see. yes, we do. Uh, yes, okay, see. we see you and your screen, so uh, okay. we're ready to hear you, please. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Dr. Gurbetos Gemmert. In this lecture, uh, we will try to find out if atrial myopathy will answer all gray areas or not. Uh, and let's start with the question, so what is atrial myopathy? Atrial myopathy is defined, uh, actually at first, in 1997, Zipes first used the term atrial myopathy to describe that AFib can lead to myopathy through atrial rem remodeling. And uh, atrial myopathy is defined by uh, EHRAS group as any complex of structural, architectural, contractile, or electrophysiological changes affecting the atria with the potential to produce clinically relevant manifestations. And in addition, four main classes of LA myopathy, left atrial myopathy, were developed by the EHRAS group based on the nature of LA damage. Uh, in class one, it's cardiomyocyte dependent, and in class two, it's primarily fibroblast dependent. In class three, we see it as mixed cardiomyocyte and fibroblast, fibroblast dependent, and in class four, it primarily consists of non-collagen deposits. Uh, when we see the uh, patients in AFib or heart failure, they both cause LA myopathy via class two or class three mechanisms. But however, the common comorbidities associated with AFib and heart failure may lead to LA myopathy through any of the mechanisms listed above. For example, obesity is associated with class three and class four, diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea with class one and class three, and hypertension with classes one and three both. So it is quite difficult to say myopathy is associated with any of these classes alone. And how will we evaluate atrial myopathy? Low amplitude P waves on ECG and continuous rhythm monitoring may signify the presence of LA myopathy due to the presence of LA scar or fibrosis. And echocardiography is a primary imaging modality used to evaluate LA myopathy. Evaluating the parameters as LA maximum volume or LA minimum volume, emptying function, functional index, and mitral inflow Doppler pattern, LA tissue Doppler, and LA strain uh, will help us but we need to remember that increased LA volume may not occur until late stages of atrial myopathy. And also mitral inflow Doppler pattern and tissue Doppler cannot be measured in the setting of AFib. 
Cardiac MRI will show us presence of microscopic LA scar via late gadolinium enhancement and will calculate the flow velocity, which may be decreased. But its biggest disadvantage is its high cost and longer examination duration. Electroanatomic mapping has high sensitivity in determining areas of impaired LA conduction, but in addition to being an invasive procedure, the cost is very high and does not provide information about LA mechanical function. So if we can combine these parameters, we will get essential information about left atrium. And atrial myopathy is really important because it may manifest as AFib or other atrial arrhythmias, atrial dilatation, impaired atrial systole, or abnormal cardiac imaging findings. And other atrial arrhythmias, such as frequent atrial premature beats or paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, and also atrial high rate episodes, might indicate a predisposition to AFib and have been associated with increased risk of stroke in long term follow up, independent of diagnosed AFib. So we can say that atrial myopathy may exist without AFib and can facilitate the development of AFib. Anatomical or structural changes, particularly fibrosis, play a major role in the pathogenesis of AFib by increasing the conduction heterogeneity in the atria. So, this provides the substrate for reentry. Development of AFib worsens the atrial myopathic processes that then help to sustain more AFib. So, the, we can say that AFib begets AFib. And atrial myopathy is typically caused by insults such as aging, inflammation, and oxidative stress and stretching of the atria. These myopathic changes alter the properties of myocardial electrophysiology and cardiac autonomic nervous system. They can also lead to architectural and structural changes characterized by fibrosis. Atrial myopathy results in endothelial dysfunction and stasis, thereby a prothrombotic state. Electrophysiological remodeling and fibrosis facilitate the development of AFib, which leads to more inflammation, fibrosis, and autonomic remodeling. And all of this will contribute to a worsening prothrombotic environment mediated by circulating inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and other molecules. AFib and thrombosis, so we can say that they can develop separately and interact closely to further aggravate the underlying atrial myopathic processes. Uh, and the investigators of famous trials demonstrated increased rates of thromboembolism in the presence of device-detected atrial high rate episodes. But they also highlighted that uh, there is an apparent lack of temporal association between episodes of subclinical AFib and subsequent strokes. And it is well described that the risk for thrombogenesis is modulated by the presence of vascular risk factors. And Charles Vask's score system was found to be valuable in predicting stroke risk in the absence of AFib. Score of zero confers minimal risk for thrombogenesis even with persistent AFib. So this indicates that AFib by itself is unlikely to, to be the sole driver for, for LA thrombogenesis. The current guidelines recommend no need for anticoagulation if the chest was score is zero or one if female, but searching for the key atrial myopathic features might be helpful in identifying individuals who need and who does need not need oral anticoagulation therapy. For example, this figure shows data of two patients with AFib who both have chest was scores of one, especially if they are female. And as it is seen on uh, column A, they really have the same Chaswa score and very similar LA volume of 107 and 104 milliliters. And uh, as it is seen on column C, column C, they have different LA blood flow velocity histograms and blood stasis maps. And on column D, visualization of stasis is color coded and the red color corresponds to an obvious increase in risk for thrombogenesis. So although they have the same Chaswa scores and the same LA volume, the risks of thromboembolism seems to be very different. So 40 flow cardiac MR derived atrial stasis may act as an important measurement for predisposition to atrial thrombogenesis. This information may provide guidance in anticoagulation therapy in selected groups of patients with AFib. So it is possible after a, uh, AFib ablations, it is possible that reverse remodeling can take place in patients at stage C, but observational studies showed that after a successful ablation, the stroke risk might be substantially reduced and cessation of anticoagulation might be safe in many patients. But conversely, 
failure of reverse remodeling after an AFib ablation might be continuously thrombogenic and cessation of oral anticoagulation therapy in this group might not be safe. So how could we separate the patients who would need oral anticoagulation therapy for a longer period of time, particularly in those with low CHASWA scores, even if they do not have AFib recurrence? Evaluation of atrial myopathy along with other parameters may provide a robust guidance for deciding on the duration of oral anticoagulation therapy. But of course, this hypothesis needs to be tested in prospective randomized trials. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very nice talk and uh, quite uh, short is needed. Uh, so we're going to uh, go further to Dr. Suzal, so Visal, uh, who is going to talk about uh, the wearable uh, devices for, for atrial fibrillation detection. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm Dr. Ali from Istanbul University, Jarrah Pasha Faculty of Medicine. I will present you today wearable devices for AFib detection. AFib is the most common arrhythmia currently affecting more than 37 million people worldwide. Untreated AFib is a significant cause of stroke, approximately 15% of all ischemic stroke cases. Early diagnosis and initiation of oral anticoagulation may prevent thromboembolic strokes. One third of the total AFib population is asymptomatic. Hence, awareness and early detection of AFib, AFib is important, especially for asymptomatic AFib cases. New tools that allow AFib detection will help make clinical decisions. Screening of AFib has several risks and benefits, but the most important thing is prevention of stroke. Early detection of AFib also prevents or reduces morbidity, hospitalization, and mortality. As you see, there are several electronic tools for screening AFib. We can divide mobile health AFib devices in three. These are photoplatysmography based, ECG based, and mechanocardiography based. Let's first talk about PPG based. PPG is an optical technique. It has spot check and semi-continuous PPG technology is used in current. Microvascular blood is lighted and it reflects a trace of the pulse blood volume, which is detected by a sensor. It usually recurs 30 seconds to one minute and analyzes change in peak to peak intervals and the pulse morphology. In case of irregularities or variations, they alert the patients. We can see false positives due to motion artifacts and ectopic bits, and it also requires smartphone application. There are two cornerstone studies on this technology. The Apple Heart study did not report the sensitivity and specificity of the PPG algorithm for AFib detection, a critical piece of missing data needed for clinical care and future research. In Huawei heart study, there are more periodic measurements could be taken automatically every 10 minutes, which was far more frequent than obtained from the episode. The prevalence of suspected AFib of 0.2% in the general population was lower than the 0.5 reported in Apple heart study. There are possibly several reasons for this. This was much younger population compared with Apple Heart study, and there is also lower incidence and prevalence of AFib in the Chinese population compared to Western population. Detect AFib Pro study compared PPG-based algorithm against cardiologists' internet-enabled ECG diagnosis to distinguish between AFib and sinus rhythm. This is the first prospective clinical two-center study to demonstrate that detection of AFib by using a smartphone camera alone is feasible with high specificity and sensitivity. Similar results were obtained in the watch AFib trial, and according to these two study, PPG signal analysis appears to be suitable for extended AFib screening. Two different application algorithms used in the Detect AFib Pro study both of them showed high sensitivity and specificity for distinguishing between AFib and sinus rhythm. 
Watch AP study also showed high sensitivity and specificity. Red stroke study is ongoing trial, which is supported by European Commission, included more than 2000 patients, high CHADVAS score, no history of AFib. This is the one of the first double blind randomized controlled trial. There is unfortunately no long term follow up. There are many completed and ongoing studies using single lint handheld ECG. If you look vital AF study, more than 30,000 patients without prevalent AFib. This is cluster randomized controlled trial, at least one year follow up. They used handheld single lead ECG. Patients included were aged more than 65 years. In results, newly diagnosed AFib detection rate is not significant between screening and control group, but the screening group was associated with an increase in the rate of AFib di diagnosis in the pre specific subgroup analyzed individuals over than 85 years of age. According to Vital AF study, screening all individuals over than 65 years of age at primary care clinical visits for AFib with a single lead handheld ECG is not an efficient way to identify undiagnosed AFib. But point of care, screening using a single lead ECG in individuals over than more than 85 years of age may be effective for identifying undiagnosed AFib. In AF catch study, more than 8,000 8, participants were randomly assigned to annual screening, quarterly screening, and quarterly screening plus group. Participants were randomly assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to annual and quarterly screening groups. The quarterly screening group was fur further randomly assigned in a three-to-one ratio to subgroups of quarterly screening and quarterly screening plus group which involved ECG screening once per week for the first month of follow-up, then quarterly for the remainder of follow-up. They record 30-second single-lead ECG. Patients included were aged more than 65 years. Quarterly screening was associated with a significant increase in the detection rate of, of AFib compared to annual screening, but no significant difference was noted between quarterly screening and the quarterly screening plus group. In stroke stop study, nearly 30,000 participants were randomly assigned one-to-one -one ratio to be invited to screening for atrial fibrillation or to a control group. Participants without a history of AFib were instructed on using a handheld single lead ECG. If patient has no prior AFib, they follow up twice daily for two weeks, this population. Residents aged 75 and 76 include in study, followed for a minimum five years with regards to primary endpoint. Combined primary endpoints are ischemic stroke or systemic thromboembolism, all-cause mortality, and severe bleeding. Looking at the group invited to screening, we could see after our screening intervention that the diagnosis of AFib became significantly more common as compared to the control group. The clinical characteristics between two groups were similar. Screening group had significantly fever events compared to those randomized the control group. The hazard ratio was small but statistically significant. In the study, when you are invited, it doesn't mean that you will participate. And we can see that not all chosen participants were able to participate. As you see, the participant group slightly younger and more healthy compared to non-participants. We could see that those participating in the screening study did significantly better when it came to the end point of ischemic stroke. However, one must be when interpreting these results that the participants were also more healthy as compared to non-participants. In conclusion, population-based screening for AFib provide a net clinical benefit in elderly population. However, efforts should be made to increase participation in AFib screening we could see that the non-participants were at the highest risk of adverse events. According to me, this is the one, one of the most sensational study. In 2018, AFib detection by analyzing facial PPG signals without physical contact using a smartphone camera was demonstrated. This is the first study that to demonstrate detection of AFib with high accuracy from multiple patients concurrently with a single camera. They recorded 64 vi videos, each capturing five patients simultaneously 
in 32 different heart rhythm permutations. Pulse irregularity in more than 50% FPPG segments for each patient was considered positive for AFI. Overall sensitivity was uh, nearly 94% and specificity 98%. False positives were seen due to artifacts and ectopic beats. Mechanocardiography based devices are less representative for mobile health linked to AFib management compared to other technologies. The monitor mechanical cardiac activity, register heart movement, and derive cardiac activity thanks to accelerometers and drops installed in smartphones placed on the patient's sternum. However, there are few published studies with only one re relevant analysis for AFib detection. Therefore, more studies are needed to improve this technology. Recent advancements in AFib detection technology offers cost effectiveness and informed preference, as well as equity and screening access to the complete target population. Hence, clinical evidence generated from ongoing multiple clinical trials will be a major help. However, there, there still needs to be further research proposing different objectives involving the, these devices. Further studies are also needed comparing different devices to each other, especially in screening capacity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very See them uh, either. So, okay. So, uh, most of the presentations are done. So, I think we have uh, Dr. Vasiliu and Dr. Husu with us as commentators. Hello. Just, uh, you know, to make things clear, my name is uh, very similar to Dr. Vasiliu, yes? <laughs> well, very It was similar. unintentional. Yes, unintentional, yes. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, First of all, uh, I would like to thank you for being with us. And uh, let's start from the ladies, Dr. Husu. Uh, do you have to add anything to uh, this, the presentations uh, we heard today? Uh, I would like to thank all the presenters for the very nice presentations. Um, I've got one question for um, Dr. Burak, if I may. Um, he presented a number of peak wave uh, indices, which might be useful in predicting atrial fibrillation. Um, I would like to ask which one he thinks it is more useful and to, whether we need to take um, reproduci reproducibility of uh, some niche peak wave parameters like the peak wave terminal force uh, into account. Uh, no. Uh, to me, uh... We have uh, more uh, data uh, with the uh, uh, interatrial block. And uh, so my favorite is interatrial block regarding predicting the atrial fibrillation. You mean advanced interatrial block? Advanced, inter yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because the intermediate uh, is not very powerful. Exactly, yeah. Um, and what about reproducibility of some peak wave indices like peak wave terminal force? I think. There was a study published that showed that reproducibility is quite poor. So do we trust such indices? What's your opinion? Uh, actually, the reproducibility for pivot terminal force, uh, uh, I, I agree with you in regards to the reproducibility is, is very uh, low. Uh, but the P wave duration and uh, and inter advanced interatrial block uh, uh, data uh, show consistency. Uh, from from our experience, because we had the same uh, problem in the beginning, uh, we had lots of uh, preferences between the observers. But uh, when we trained them to uh, first of all everything was electronic uh, and uh, magnified, and uh, we were very uh, actually we took only the measurements where we were very sure where the start and the, the end was. And uh, then we did a small study between us. And uh, after the second or the third time, the uh, variation was much less. So then we started our study to be sure what uh, we're doing. 
and uh, you know there, there's been a lot of uh, uh, works on uh, this but uh, uh, I, what we we've seen was uh, the uh, alternate uh, p wave uh, morphologies so we've seen uh, by excluding all uh, noise and uh, apcs uh, that uh, there were two or three different population of P waves within the same recording of uh, the same patient without moving, without anything else affecting that. And uh, then uh, we calculated the difference and we saw that uh, uh, the majority of the patients who had the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation history, uh, they had more variants. So then we analyzed more uh, the P waves the different P waves, and uh, we've seen uh, that uh, we came up with uh, an index, and uh, we saw that in clinical practice, at least we use that, uh, but it's not very widely, uh, you know, applicable. Uh, we can get quite, uh, you know, with an accuracy of uh, 0.8. Uh, and now we try to see if this correlates with uh, uh, the. Uh, left atrial voltage mapping we have for these patients and now we are on this uh, process but uh, having that in mind I would like uh, uh, to ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mert who talks about uh, the atrial myopathy uh, how uh, again how accurate do you feel that uh, these measurements are going First of all, with uh, echocardiography, you know, we, we, the LA indices, uh, you know, they're, they're very nice, but uh, they differ even from uh, company to company. So what's your opinion, in, in, again, in clinical practice? Uh, uh, do you, do you feel fine? You. Yeah, I agree with you, but also I, hmm. I want to say that, again, that... Uh, some parameters uh, they occur very at the late stages of atrial myopathy but still even if they uh, differ from operator to operator it may be still useful i think and it may be just a part of the other parameters so we will we should uh, look over to not, how can i say that uh, look along to all parameters for example cardiac mri we can also use cardiac MRI. And the mm -hmm. P rate, and actually, all these parameters will be helpful to define the atrial myopathy if patient has it or not. Uh, and it, I really believe that it will be helpful to decide if the oral anticoagulation therapy is uh, needed for a longer period of time or not. So, uh, of course, it is not the only parameter to use the atrial myopathy. The all of them, the echo echocardiography, ECG, cardiac MRI, or electroanatomic mapping, but uh, we need to use it with clinic. We should, uh, it needs to take a part in clinic, clinical site. Yeah. This is my opinion. I, I think that uh, as, as atrial myopathy is concerned, the more, uh, uh, the higher the charge VASC is, the higher the chances to have uh, atrial myopathy is. So these things go together. And, and uh, of course, atrial fibrillation, I think everybody is convinced now that atrial fibrillation per se is not the cause, or at least in at least in 50% of the cases, is not the cause of uh, the embolic events. And so something else is happening in the endothelium or in the in the myocardium or in the function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is atrial myopathy, and uh, my way of understanding is that if this is expressed uh, with all these uh, factors that are, f are affecting the atrium, then uh, probably we may not need uh, something uh, very precise to say, oh, this guy is going to get uh, uh, anticoagulants or not. What do you think, uh, Dr. Vasileu? What's your opinion on this? Yes, um, I agree with everything that has been said. And one of the questions I wanted to, to ask the speakers is how do we go from sort of population-based studies um, where we show that, you know, high atrial rates or 
any evidence of atrial myopathy being decided by atrial volume or being decided by atrial strain or being decided by late gadolinium enhancement on the MRI, which is my own uh, specialty. Um, but then how do we go from translating the studies where you might have a twofold risk or fivefold risk to actually coming down to the particular people that they are benefited? So um, in, in answer to your question, Professor Vasilikos, I think we, whilst I believe and I understand the mechanism and I agree with them, where I have a little bit of uh, hesitancy is when I have a patient in front of me, can all these things be applied? Can, can we take, for example, the P wave indices on their own um, and, and ignore other comorbidities like hypertension, like the age, like what gender the people are? Or can we take the results of an echocardiogram alone and, and, in, and forget about everything else? And, and whilst individually in papers and in population, they're absolutely helpful and they guide where we go in the future, I would welcome your thoughts, Dr. Merzen and Dr. Burak, about how we translate from the population level to the to the personal individual level. Um, I think we, we should describe uh, first uh, the the most risky patients. Uh, uh, so uh, we should screen the. Uh, all the things together, the, the echocardiogram, the ECG parameters, and uh, uh, the clinical ECG parameters, and we should screen with the non-invasive uh, parameters. Uh, we, use, we should use non-invasive parameters to closely monitor uh, these patients. So uh, you feel that uh, everything is helpful, but... Uh... Nothing is helpful by itself, of course. Yes, exactly. Yes, mo mo <laughs> most of the things uh, that occur in medicine. Uh, right. Uh, I, you know, MRI is very, very. You know, everybody talks about MRI, etc. So, uh, what's your opinion uh, to if we should use MRI in patients with uh, a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? And, you know, we don't look for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you know, in the so-called the low atrial fibrillation, which is not low anymore, but, you know, it's, you know, 55-year-old with a little bit of hypertension with a normal echo, uh, you know, a little bit overweight, you know, the usual middle-aged guy who gets atrial fibrillation, and a little bit of alcohol. So... How do you feel of uh, using in clinical practice MRI? Is it uh, useful or should we abandon that? Because nowadays everybody talks about MRI. I would like your opinion. You always don't have... Who, hmm? who is this addressed to Prof. Asilikos? Sorry. Uh, I would like uh, to hear uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mert, who's... Yeah, I, I really would like to use MRI because it may be helpful as I uh, showed the figure uh, in my presentation. Uh, although they seem to be in the same Chatsva score, they seem to have the same Chatsva score or the same other risk factors, they really may have really different actual myopathic processes. So we can describe the myopathic atrial myopathy and we can uh, decide not maybe it's it's um, it's a very strong uh, the decision is very strong but not decide we may think or we may just evaluate the need for anticoagulation and the mri with the uh, flow velocity if because they can it can show us if there is stasis or not even if they have the st same la volume so i think it will be useful and I think it will be used more and frequently in the future uh, to define the atrial myopathy or uh, to decide if there is a stasis or if there is an increased risk of thrombogenesis, thromboembolic risk uh, for patients. I think it will be used more and more frequently in the future. And I Do really you, wish to use it. Yeah. Do you agree, Dr. Vasiliu? 
So I think MRI is an umbrella of many things, and um, and it depends on what you ask the MRI to do. Unlike ECHO, which can serve as a screening tool, you really need to have a specific question for the MRI. And the reason I'm saying that is routinely, we do not look for atrial scar. We look for ventricular scar and assume that if you have ventricular scar in the context of somebody with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, it's the same process, therefore the atrium will be affected. Having said that, in the research arena, uh, we have done quite a lot of atrial uh, MRIs looking at atrial scar. And what we see is that it associates very well in people that then undergo ablation procedures and who remain atrial fibrillation free. In other words, if you don't have atrial scar, you, your ablation procedure is more successful. If you have a lot of atrial scar, your ablation procedure is not successful. And that could, in fact, guide who should remain uh, on anticoagulation after an apparently successful atrial fibrillation procedure. Now, the difficulty with the MRI at the moment is that to the post-processing to define the atrial scar is quite laborious, and it takes about 25 minutes in somebody that actually knows how to do it, whereas a ventricular scar takes about 10 seconds. Coming back to AI, I have no doubt that in the next five years, we will have new sequences for atrial scarring, specifically for the people with atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. There will be AI post-processing where we can get the atrial volumes, we can get the atrial strain, we can get the atrial percentage of late gadolinium enhancement all done by, by the computer automatically, and we just have to check that, you know, the, the regions of interest are correct. And I think when that comes, and it's applicable for everyday clinical practice, uh, it will be a good moment for patients with atrial fibrillation. Of course, we will need to run the studies then, and we will need to randomize these people to either having ablations or not, and see how they fare after them. And then after the ablation, we need to randomize them in continu uh, dual, uh, continuing anticoagulation or stopping it early on the basis of what the MRI uh, scan shows in association with their other risk factor profile. So I think the future is, is very bright for the MRI, uh, but when it comes to making decisions about atrial fibrillation patients, I don't think we are there just yet. Okay. What do you think, uh, Dr. Husu? Um, I agree with what Professor Vasilou is saying about the cardiac MRI. Um, I mean, I don't think we are there yet to use it individually on patients with atrial fibrillation at the moment to guide whether we anticoagulate them or not. I, I think uh, that uh, if we can justify the, the scar, which is, you know, what we're asking for, probably we may deny the therapies to people who have very scarred atria anyway. Yes, we're not going to do uh, an ablation on somebody who has lots of scar in uh, their area because uh, you know that uh, the recurrence rate is going to be high anyway. Uh, I, something else now uh, about uh, the monitoring of the patients. Uh, what uh, Dr. Suyal uh, was referred to the nice, uh, all these nice gadgets we have. Uh, I have a nice, very nice watch, which is very good looking as well. It's not like the Apple Watch. Uh, the Rolex doesn't, didn't produce any, <laughs> any smart watch yet, but I'm sure there's plenty for, of room for that. But uh, the, the difficulty for this, except the quality of the signal, is that the, this kind of smart watch has to monitor you all the time. Uh, in market, uh, we've seen that there are some uh, very nice and small uh, patches which you wear for uh, the monitoring, one or three leads. Uh, do you think that uh, these are going to get you more information or you're going to get uh, with more workloads and uh, who's going to read this, uh, who's going to do that? In other words, we do this because we like uh, to do research or we want to get more information. But as a clinician who works very hard and has 1,000 patients uh, who has, you know, you're not going to get paid for this. In other words, in your country, 
how is this kind of information is uh, yeah. we mostly we suggest our patients uh, especially after AFP ablation uh, to see the recurrences in the early stage of uh, after post post procedural recurrences uh, but uh, it's not uh, always possible to uh, suggest our patients because uh, because of the cost effectiveness and the uh, prices of the iWatch or other devices, uh, they couldn't get every devices to detect the arrhythmias or uh, other AFib detections. We we can't we can't always uh, suggest our patients, but some some peop, some patients uh, get the uh, iWatch and the other devices. Uh, mostly we can see the recurrences in the early stage of post procedure. Uh, and we can uh, manage the post recurrences in these patients. Okay, uh, Dr. Hoshu. Um, in our center, we are just about to start using the Zaya patches, which can monitor people for two weeks. But initially, the plan is to use it in high risk patients to um, detect the AF like patients with uh, cryptogenic strokes. Uh, instead mm -hmm. of hotel monitoring, but at this very moment, they're not. We are not using them routinely. So, although the technology is there, you know, we still uh, have uh, problems. Not only practical problems, but also uh, reimbursement problems. And uh, probably, if you were going to get uh, at some stage to have uh, tele monitoring from uh, an iWatch, I'm sure they can do it even today. But then you have the legal uh, thing that, uh, you know, if you get an arrhythmia which is life threatening at uh, two o'clock in the morning, then who is responsible to record that? Because, you know, in uh, some Western countries, you know, they have all the facilities and uh, the manpower to do that. But in most countries, it's not there. So I want your opinion also on this, Dr. Vasileu and uh, uh, Dr. Burak, etc. Um, I, I agree completely both about the reimbursement, but also about the responsibility. Who is ultimately responsible for that? And, and certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, where both Dr. Chusu and I uh, work in hospitals 50 miles from each other, we would not be able to have somebody to look at any anything that is being sent over through an eye watch at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning. So it is something that needs to be addressed. What I'm also less clear is um, what do we do with pieces of information? For example, a 65 year old man with no other risk factors gets 10 seconds of atrial fibrillation. We don't know what to do with these people, and, and they are now increasingly coming don't in. Don't be polite. Don't be polite. Say one hour of atrial fibrillation. But even one hour even for one hour, yes. Yeah, I mean, even one hour is is unclear in some patients. You know, one oh. hour over three years. Um, yeah. Is this is this worth anticoagulating? I don't know. Nobody knows, and certainly. Um, in, in the times to come, there needs to be a study on the basis of, of wearables detected AF in previously healthy individuals. Um, but coming back to your question, I agree that technology is there to implement this on a national level. Um, but the, uh, the manpower to look after the vast amount of, of, of ECGs that we will be getting daily uh, is, is certainly not there at the moment or to do it over a 24-7 period. Thank you, thank you. I think we've uh, done. I don't know if there are any questions from the audience, so no.